this word Gaia keeps co coming up. What is it? What What is Gaia? Well, <clears throat> for us moderns, uh, Gaia has come from science. And it's the scientific idea that the Earth is one gigantic living organism. You know, just like you are, are alive, I am alive, trees are alive, you know, cats and dogs are alive. The planet's also a kind of life. Uh, and it's a scientific idea. And the planet's alive because of all the interactions between all the living beings and all the rocks and all the atmosphere and all the water. And uh, the livingness of the planet comes out of that, out of all those relationships. I put it like that in a simple sort of way. Ah, and how could you tell the difference between something that's alive and something that isn't alive? What is it that makes something a living thing as opposed to a, a not a living thing? Yeah, that's, that's a good question and not, not easy to answer. One, one aspect of a living thing is that it self-organizes. So living beings create themselves out of themselves all of the time. For example, you know, the other day I cut my thumb and I had a, quite an injury in my thumb. And I've been watching how my thumb, my body's been healing that wound. You know, it's a very complex process going on to heal that wound. So my, my body is alive, obviously. And so it's able to repair damage and restore um, its network relationships. And living, living beings do that. They, they, come, they organize themselves from out of themselves. And if any of the components of their system diminish or get too numerous, uh, the rest of the system acts to, to bring that particular aspect of itself back to the right level. That's what we call self-regulation, you know. Something in my body, let's say my calcium levels go up too much, the rest of my body, if I'm healthy, recognizes that and brings my calcium levels down to what's best for me. And if they get too low, the opposite happens, they're increased by, by the body's intelligence. And the idea is that the earth is no different. It's got this massive intelligence, just like we do, because of all these interactions I was mentioning earlier. And what are your favorite examples of self-regulation on a planetary level? Well, I suppose one of them uh, involves the Amazon rainforest. Because what happens in the Amazon rainforest is, of course, most of the forest is thousands of miles away from the ocean. So the question is, why is it a rainforest thousands of miles from the ocean? It, to be a rainforest, you need rain. So how, how come there's rain all the way far away from the ocean in the, in, in the Amazon? Well, the, the, the answer is that the, the plants themselves generate their own rainfall. But in the most amazing way, what they do is they, they emit cloud seeding chemicals from their, their leaves. And these chemicals actually are very, smell very nice to us. They have sort of minty smells and camphory smells. They're often very medicinal for us as it happens. But anyway, these chemicals that they release go off into the air above the forest. And there, um, they seed clouds. That reduces the air pressure. Uh, and that brings water in from higher pressure areas over the ocean, where, which is full of water. And so water-rich air comes in, surging in from the ocean into the forest and dumps more rain. So the forest recycles its rain, maintains its rain, and self-regulates itself. But also the clouds that it seeds are dense and white and they reflect solar energy space and they cool the entire planet. And they're part of the planetary temperature regulation dynamic involving clouds seeded by life. One and of the things forests do is that they actively contribute to maintaining the environment that helps forests. That's right. What they're doing is um, they are, I mean, in, in the case of the Amazon, rainforest it needs rain and they're making they're, they're creating their own rain but more than that they're also um, bringing in moist air from the ocean thousands of miles away which carries water which then becomes rain so and it, sorry and more than that in the process they're helping to regulate the temperature of the whole planet sorry how do they bring in the water from the ocean well they release these cloud seeding chemicals and those chemicals 
make whatever water there is up there. Of course, there's already a lot of water up there because it's all a process that's ongoing, you know. So there's already a lot of water up, up there. The water can't become a cloud un unless it's got something to condense around. And these chemicals are perfect cloud condensation nuclei. And so the water condenses. Now the water is no longer a gas in the atmosphere. It's now water. Oh, it's now water. So the air pressure has dropped. And that means that higher pressure air over the ocean, which is full of moisture, gets sucked in to fill the vacuum. Wow. You know? So, and, and I can also, I remember reading um, in Jim Lovelock's, one of his books, he talks about, I think it's the High Khan Desert in Pakistan mm -hmm. that used to be forest. Yeah. And when the forest got destroyed, yeah. it had an impact. You had the loss of this protective effect on microclimate yeah. in a way that amplified desertification. Yeah, and that's what's going to happen in the Amazon. It's happening now, you know. That, that crazy man, if I may say so, Bolsonaro, you know, is, uh, is really promoting the deforestation of the Amazon. So the Amazon quite soon will reach a tipping point where there aren't enough trees to keep the water moving in from the ocean and the, ocean, the Amazon will collapse into a, a savanna, which will be much warmer. And that's going to have impacts on the climate of the entire planet. And it's been modeled quite well by scientists. This, this thing of the, of, of the water coming in, of cloud seeding by the trees, is called the flying rivers. Um, the flying rivers or the biotic pump. Um, there are other examples. I mean, you probably don't want me to give you too many examples, but there are marine algae in the ocean, tiny little unicellular algae, that also emit cloud seeding chemicals. Actually, it's the chemical that smells like the sea. You know, when you go down to the sea and you, you breathe some, take some seaweed, and breathe it in. That's the gas dimethyl sulfide, which these little algae also emit. And they, that, those, that gas also seeds clouds. And these are planet cooling clouds. So they also help to keep the planet cool and help to regulate the temperature of the planet. So when we, there's information about the decline in um, the tiny life forms in the ocean, mm. it's deeply relevant to us because they play a role in keeping a healthy balance of nature, one that's favorable to us. Yeah, we need them to regulate our temperature, to keep our temperature within you know, a nice, comfortable state. But we're warm, they're like a cool ocean, and we're warming the ocean, and so they're gradually dying off. So we're killing off some of the key life forms that are helping Gaia to be Gaia, in other words, Gaia to regulate her climate. So um, some of this stuff, like the awareness of Gaia theory and the awareness of how important life is, the living systems on which we depend and seeing their destruction, I'm just wondering, that sounds very um, depressing to be as aware as you are about the impact that this is having. Yeah, well, it's both depressing and amazing. I mean, it's amazing to be part of a living planet. I mean, to be a human being inside a living planet. That's amazing. But it's depressing to see what we're doing to the planet. Ah, so I'm just wondering also this question, what helps us face our concerns and respond in a way that we're contributing to recovery and um, supporting restoration of life? And I wonder how you see Gaia theory there. Well, for me, Gaia theory has shown me that the planet is not something external to us, as our culture would like us to believe. Our culture wants us to believe that the planet is just a dead bunch of stuff that we can use as we like. You know, it's something we can do things to. We can use it to, for growing our economy. We can mine its minerals. We can extract its waters and its her oils, etc. cetera. Um, so she's an external thing. We are in here. The planet is out there, the whole of nature is out there, it's all dead, and we can use it as we want. In fact, it's there for us to use. That's, that's what's caused the problem. But with Gaia theories, it turns everything on its head. Now we realize that we're living inside a great living being. Just like bacteria live inside our guts, and we need those bacteria to keep us going, you know. So do we living organisms live inside this gigantic 
planetary living being. So rather than everything being an outside, we're actually inside Gaia. I'm inside Gaia. And as my friend David Abram likes to say, this planet of ours is our second body, our larger body. We have two bodies, human body, and then the larger body of Gaia, in which we're like a symbiotic bacteria, you know. So now I'm living inside myself, my wider self. And if I'm living inside my wider self, of course I'm going to take care of myself with a capital S. Of course I am, because um, it's part of me. 